Hello and welcome everyone to the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance's Crypto Roundup for Friday, September 27th, 2024. Ron Quaranta here with my amazing friend and co-host, the one, the only David Brill, our fellow co-host Joshua Ashley Clayman, I believe is somewhere over the Atlantic, either in the Gulf Stream or the Bombardier, David. Uh, lots of news to cover this week and we get an opportunity to go deep on some of the economic stuff. Uh, David, um, before we begin, for everyone in the audience, again, thank you all for joining us. If you've got questions or comments for David or I, please hit us up in the chat on LinkedIn Live, on Twitter, on YouTube as well. And before we begin, obviously, anything David and I are discussing are only our opinions, don't necessarily represent the opinions of our respective firms. And David, we will never give advice. It's not accounting legal tax. It's not token advice. You certainly don't want that kind of advice from me. Uh, before we begin, David, it's a risk on week. Yes, it is, Ron. And what's uh, going on? There is so much bullish economic data for the crypto space that, uh, you know, I have a list of like two pages long of things I'd want to talk about. So diving into it, I think the biggest thing is, <clears throat> like we talked about last week with the 50 basis point cut, we're starting to see risk on assets starting to benefit from that. And we're seeing that flow. So we're really actively seeing the flow. We saw 10 billion in stable coins being minted that are you know, being put to work in the crypto ecosystem. Uh, the small cap index, so Russell's up today and on and on. So there's a lot of bullish uh, macro data. And then I think the most interesting thing that I came across, like as I was researching for today, is that this is a, this September, if it closes where we are now, will be the biggest up month for crypto, for Bitcoin, excuse me, ever. And we're looking at about 10% gain for September. So a lot of people have been talking about October, but we might already be in September. David, it's interesting. I, and I, I'm with you. I see these price increases. And part of me wants to tie that to you know, a 50 basis point uh, decrease in interest rates, really Ooh. starting to drive the idea of chasing yield again. Uh, and you begin to see this in some of the interesting things. When you look at, you know, you look at Robinhood and some of these others that are paying interest on deposits, they quietly lowered all of the interest rates. That'll continue to happen. We're even hearing calls for another 50 basis point cut in, in the interest rates. It's also interesting how the ripple effect has happened with that. So I was looking at the ETFs. And if I correct me if I'm wrong, I think I saw something like $600 million in inflows on crypto ETFs, which are generally institutional driven. How much longer can that go on? $600 million is not a small number for inflows. Well, look, I mean, I think there's still a lot of uh, players that are under allocated if if they're inclined to be allocated into our space. So I think there's a lot of money. And remember, a lot of the wirehouses still haven't approved, right. you know, crypto for their account holders or wealth management holders. So I think there's really a lot of powder. I won't call it dry powder because it'd be reallocated from somewhere else. But there's a lot of powder out there, um, a lot of powder that hasn't had access and I think another thing that's really bullish is the ETF for BlackRock's uh, IBIT uh, Bitcoin ETF that will be allowed. It's been approved. It'll take some time to sort of work its way through the system. Mm -hmm. but I think that's also going to be really bullish for the space as people get, uh, you know, hedging, people getting access, you know, through options and, you know, speculating a little bit too. So. I think we're really going to see a fair amount of liquidity kind of coming coming in. You know, and so David, when, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like you mentioned, another 50 basis points in November. Like, what do you think about that? I feel like you know, I had predicted pro previously that a 50 basis point cut would look a little panicky. Mm. Um, that doesn't seem to have necessarily been the case. And you're, and you're seeing Fed governors actually saying, "Look, another 50 basis point rise uh, decrease." probably makes sense. But to me, you know, it goes back to something you and I have always spoken about, which is almost all of the data the Fed consumes are is lagging data. Mm -hmm. And it's something that it's one thing to say, well, look, we're going to do the first cut of 50 basis points, maybe a second cut as 50 basis points. For those of us who know economic history, we've seen this kind of playbook before where, you know, going back 40 plus years, the Fed cuts interest cuts, sorry, raises interest rates to kill off inflation, kills off inflation, rapidly cuts interest rates in, you know, 50 basis point chunks and inflation comes roaring back. And again, not to sound too cynical, but I do worry about these very big hammer moves 
from the Fed. And I'll tie that into something else, David. The, the data this morning, the Fed's preferred index was the uh, personal consumption expenditures, the PCE, uh, which is very wonky. And for a lot of people who don't track, you know, monetary policy uh, and Fed policy, doesn't make sense. But PCE um, omits energy and food, <laughs> which arguably for the majority of people is are the two biggest fields where prices have been stubbornly high. So again, I'm, I'm not saying there shouldn't be a 50 basis point move. It just feels very knee jerk. And mm. I wonder what that's going to mean as more data comes in. And I, I shout out to Bloomberg. I didn't see the entirety of the session. But this morning, they were talking about uh, on the radio, I believe, how much of all of the data gets revised. Yeah, and revised <laughs> significantly and more so than ever before. So to me, I'd rather see slow and steady over time. Um, but whether or not that's 50 basis points, I don't know. Right now, everyone's acting like it's a party. And that's fine. Yeah, it's very strange. Because like you said, we're data dependent. But then we revise the data significantly month after month. Right. And so we're kind of lowering rates based on data that's imperfect, that gets revised downward, it seems every single time. Yeah. And so what I would say is that I think that the labor market, especially on the white collar side, is worse mm. than what's being reported. And I consistently believe that. Um, but these cuts aren't really going to help the people who probably need it. Right. It will help commercial real estate. It will help real estate to some extent, although I think we need more cuts to get more people motivated to sell and more people to motivated to buy. Right. So it might start dealing with the gridlock for that. But I think for the like lower and middle class folks, like I don't think this really changes anything. And if anything, if rents keep going up from this somehow, then it makes it worse. And right. uh, you know, I think I saw something that like egg prices are keep going up. So it's very interesting. I wish somebody were more, I wish folks were more dynamic in their descriptions of this, but feels like small middle class wage earners are not going to benefit from this. You know what their credit cards will go from 25 percent to 24 and a half percent. Right. <laughs> right. With high balances. Right. I think you yeah. and noted like their credit card balances are, if not at all time highs, are certainly significantly higher. So who, you know, yes, I think corporate real estate, I think real estate in general, I think risk on assets and small caps benefit. But like if you look at the economy, like people in the US, I don't know that white collar jobs are improving. And I don't know that, you know, lower and middle class folks buying power is improving. Anything that's probably eroding a little bit. So yeah. net net, I, you know, I think the last thing I want to say is that like you said, like when I always thought of a 50 basis cut move is like something really material is happening. Right. You know, and now like it, it seems wholly unnecessary, like this, you know, the market's at all time highs. Yeah. Um, you know, we can debate where inflation really is. I think it's higher than we, what is reported when we kind of yeah. put in the things that we all have to pay for every day. Yep. Yep. So net net, I, I, you know, I think they were late to the party, but I don't really see a reason to do 50 in November. I agree with you. And I think the other thing that's hard for everyone to keep in mind, particularly for folks who don't focus on kind of the data mm. in their day to day lives, is that it takes a while for these changes to percolate through a 20 plus trillion dollar economy. Yeah. And, you know, in the same way, interest rate increases to stave off inflation took the better part of 18 months or, or almost two years, if I recall correctly. Um, that will be the same process here. So we see data like, oh, the Fed dropped interest rates 50 basis points. Mortgage applications are up, um, you know, relatively. That's a very small sliver of the impact that's going to happen. And that ha that impact will take many, many months. So, again, I think some of this, when you see an interest rate cut like this and we see the markets doing really well, like most market prices, David, that you and I know, those are anticipations of future prices and future economic activity. So um, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I suspect it'll probably will be a 50 basis point cut. Um, and I think, is that meeting after the election, David? Do you recall? I don't remember the date of the meeting itself. I think it is after the election. I don't know. I would certainly think the, we know that politics don't play a role in it. Or Allegedly. So, so we're told. <laughs> um, 
boy, you know, I think if one party were to win, I don't know that, you know, I mean, maybe after the fact they'd be for it, but I know they weren't for it <laughs> prior to. Right, right. And, you know, the former president has had already campaigns with the first cut saying it's a politically motivated interest rate cut. You know, say what you want about Jerome Powell and Powell and the Fed, but I, I don't suspect it's politically motivated one way or the other. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I, one last thing I'll add to this, David, I don't mean to over talk the whole interest rate decreases as well. You know, everyone looks at it through the lens of, oh, mortgage rates are going to come down and people will sell their houses and our credit card debt will be more affordable, um, you know, on the margins. But it's important to look at, you know, things like the, the, the corporate aspects of this. When interest rates come down, it changes capital allocation for companies. When interest rates come down, it changes financial structures for companies, whether or not they buy, they borrow to fund capital expansion or to fund investment. Um, so it really percolates through companies first, simply because they have to set those strategic plans for the coming 12 to 18 months. The average household, sadly, is not setting that strategic plan. Um, <laughs> they're sitting there kind of waiting for the next thing that happens. Companies have to use this data to plan, and it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Well, look, I will tell you from a business standpoint, we're certainly seeing more people kicking the tires on crypto projects or investments, joint ventures, m and right. So I think this is bullish for that part of the market, you know, barring the bigger deals that have the FTC hurdle to deal with. Yeah. Uh, but we are seeing you know, companies in the space looking to allocate some of their resources to different kind of crypto projects. So I think that is definitely bullish. David, you know, moving from that point where we're talking about the interest rate in, uh, declines um, to looking at the crypto market price action that you mm -hmm. and I have seen, some of the alt coins have seen double digit price, double, double digit percentage increases. I'm having a hard time speaking today. Um, does that worry you a little bit? Like you and I talk about Bitcoin, we talk about Ethereum, we look at certain tokens, again, none of this is an endorsement, but we, tokens that we think are part of very robust, interesting projects that have utility and value and use. Mm. But does it worry you when you see Shiba Inu up 16%, for example? So it's really funny. There really is a correlation. When Bitcoin goes up, it seems like the meme coins go up also. Right. And you're starting to see that. And I've seen that trend over and over. So. Look, I think I've come around to the point that meme coins, I think at some point will become sort of these social network kind of tokens and that they'll have this social benefit, whether it's some ecosystem. Um, so no, I, you know what, I'm kind of of the view, everybody likes to speculate. And to me, meme coins are like the, the true pink sheets of crypto. And so right. if people want to speculate, I think more serious folks in the space are not really playing too much in that area or maybe, you know, very little. Yeah. Uh, but no, I think at one point it did concern me that the capital I was going to mean coins weren't going to real, like we'll say layer one altcoins. But mm -hmm. at this point, you know, this is what I'll call the casino part of our ecosystem. Right. And, you know, look, more power to people if they think that they can make money in, in those, fine. Um, I'm not really a player in that for the most part. You know, David, it does bring me to something interesting, though, and we've we've also kind of spoken to some of this, and it's almost a philosophic question, right? Is speculation becoming more democratized because of crypto? In the same way I would look at is wagering on outcomes in elections. I'm thinking some of the election prediction markets where you can wager on them. Is that type of speculation becoming more democratized? And is that, a, as long as we protect investors, is that a good thing? I mean, I think betting is in, in Americans' DNA. Yeah. I mean, I think whether it's, you know, on football, on, you know, March Madness, mm -hmm. on now the elections, um, I think, you know, for better or for worse, I think it's part of our DNA and sort of people like to win. And, uh, you know, from that competitive standpoint, I'm all for it. Um, I just think people just have to have their eyes open, you know. Right. If you're buying something that's a meme of something, you know, you're really going to, would you would you go to the bank and withdraw five thousand dollars or charge five thousand dollars worth of like a picture with an uh, with a you know an animal on it or a cartoon figure on it? No. And I think that's the way you have to think about it. Like I can see people betting. Okay, I think Trump's you know not me personally, but uh, hey, directionally, I think the Republicans are going to win the Senate, and I want to bet 
thousand dollars on poly market, they're going to win the Senate. More power to them. Yep. You know, it, it's, it's I don't think it's much more different than betting on. Uh, hey, I think the Jets are going to beat the Broncos on Sunday. Like, I don't know how much they'll win by, but oh, maybe I think they'll win right. by a touchdown. So, uh, I kind of look at it that way. What about you, Ron? How do you think about like the meme coins and their role in the ecosystem? I, you know. I, I think, you know, so you and I have spoken about the, the, the projects and the tokens and the layer ones that we think have value across different aspects of the ecosystem. Certainly the layer twos and seeing how some of them might interoperate, I think is important. I, I think there's a speculative gambling mentality to it. And, and I think, you know, to be clear, like people should be protected from rug pulls. I mean, I, you know, you and I get the aspect of people should be protected to the extent we can protect them. That said... Every state in this country has a pretty robust lottery service that gets billions and billions and billions of dollars every year. Uh, and I know that in some states, I think it funds education or whatever that may be, but the government's not cracking down on that. And arguably, the people who spend, spend the most money on that are the people who shouldn't spend the most money on, mm. on a lottery. So I think there's a portion of it, and I don't mean to sound negative, but people want to speculate. People want to speculate on some things, and if there's an upside to them, you know, as long as they don't risk, you know, the food money for the house or yeah. the mortgage payment, I think that's very important. But I also look at it from a different context, David, and tell me if you're if I'm wrong. Um, I get data analytic -y on it when I look at things like prediction markets and when I think, look at things like where money is going into the altcoins, because I think that's a real true representation of what I'll broadly call the wisdom of the crowds. Mm. And the reason I say that, particularly the prediction markets, but also some of what we're seeing in the altcoins, um, the latest predictions for the election, um, some of the prediction markets are more closely matching the actual data than some of the surveys of who's going to vote in what way. And I think in particularly in local election, um, in state elections, the prediction markets have more accurate data because they're culling it from a broader base of information. And I think there's value there. Look, I do too. Um... I don't think the polls are particularly effective because I think there's a type of person who will respond to political polling and there's a type of person who won't. Right. And so I don't know that it really captures a great piece of voters in a certain place because I think a, a certain cohort is just not going to talk to those pollers. Right. right. So, um, but I want to come back to crypto because when you were talking about the altcoins and, uh, right. You know, we've been in this sort of six month corrective period since March. We saw like highs in all coins in March. Mm -hmm. And I think you're seeing some of the more quality projects start to um, get some momentum. You know, I there are a few that I would, you know, typically mention specifically, but I, at this point, I still don't want to mention specific projects. But I think the high quality layer ones that are in the top sort of 50 tokens, and I think some uh, tokens that are in certain sort of ecosystems like the AI tokens and some of right. these other tokens are starting to have like bullish catalysts and are starting to move. And we've moved out of this range that those altcoins were in. So I think that you're going to start seeing as risk on is coming more, you know, becoming more prevalent now. I think you're going to see people put money in Bitcoin. The Bitcoin appreciates. I think you'll see people roll some of their profits into altcoins. Yeah. And I think for the buyers, who are already in altcoins, who've sort of ridden down the sort of painful six months. I think if they have dry powder, they will start going back into the projects that they like and either doubling down or just adding to their positions. David, where are the gaming Web3 tokens in all of this? I, I know that you track that much more than I do, mm. and you've probably forgotten more about it than I know, but I, where are you seeing that kind of trend? You know, it's been quiet lately, but I think as more focus goes on to use cases, you know, I still think these AI tokens, the gaming tokens, um, the tokens that allow, you know, robust building on them, like the yeah. Ethers and Solanas and Avalanches of the world, you know, those that can really build robust ecosystems are going to continue to grow. Right. And I chose those three because they have robust ecosystems. And yeah, um, and you're not endorsing them. We get no, it. I'm not. I'm just saying, like, if you think of some of like the biggest tokens that are being built upon, it's really... Yeah. Ethereum and Solana and Avalanche. You know, David, as we look at all of that price action and then, you know, the, the talk has been look at where the market's going and 
you and I joke about our Bitcoin wager, which far too many people are interested now, <laughs> interested in at this point, David. But it is interesting. Uh, and tell me if you saw the same thing. You know, in the, in the background of all of this is uh, the, still the resolution to the FTX case. Mm. And, you know, there was a time when we talked about if we would have talked about someone being sentenced several months ago, it would have been front page news in every crypto kind of portal you can imagine. And today it's almost perfunctory. And again, I'm not wishing anything other than the news for everyone in the audience. Caroline Ellison was sentenced to two years. She was a cooperative written, witness in the, the government's case against Sam Bankman Freed uh, for the fall of FTX. David, does that speak to the markets move beyond bad actors and bad news and is now focusing on fundamentals? Well, look, I think, you know, FTX is in the rearview mirror, I think, for a lot of people now. And I think, you know, it's not clear when that distribution will be made. I think the plan is scheduled to be confirmed in October. Yeah. And then you just don't know when that money will be released. There's always an administrative time it takes. And maybe for tax purposes, they decide to wait till January to distribute the funds if they right. if the creditors decide that's what's in their best interest. Um, so that is like an avalanche of liquidity, you know, somewhere between, I think, 10 and 12 billion dollars of fiat, not crypto, unfortunately, will be returned to customers. And I think, you know, you could expect that customers will put a fair amount of that to work. Right. Um, with regard to the sentencing, I actually have been looking at it a little differently. I'm wondering if sort of CZ being released this weekend is sort of like the start of this next bull run, mm. um, sort of the you know, the biggest name in our ecosystem being released after his short prison stint, more than like Caroline's kind of looking backwards. Right. CZ's looking backwards, but it's sort of looking forwards. And like now he's released. It almost feels like it's just in time with the markets to start exploding again or moving forward again. Right. So I've been looking at it that way. But what do you think about Caroline getting to uh, two months, uh, two years, excuse me. I mean, look, I, I, you know, given the scope of the fraud, um, even with her, and if you read some, it's, it's always fascinating reading, you know, the, the court renderings on these things. And the judge made a really good point, you know, as cooperative as she was, and, he, and I think someone in government called her the most cooperative, cooperative witness they've seen, and her, her testimony was integral to the government's case. You know, there's no free lunch, right? Yeah. You, you, and and the and Judge Kaplan, I believe it was Judge Kaplan, wisely said, you know, there's no get out of jail free card for frauds yeah. of this size. It, the, the harm it caused. We can have an argument about, you know, uh, some of the values coming back. I, I think over 100 percent of value, or close to 100 percent of the value in the bankruptcy is coming back to creditors. David, I could be wrong. So it's the cash value of the crypto yes. at that moment in time. <clears throat> I push back on the idea that all of the value is coming back because I feel like if all the crypto came back, <clears throat> then people would be, right. you know, but, uh, you know, a significant amount is coming back, which is, uh, you know, a benefit. Yeah. Um, look, these things are dynamic, but at some point you have to know that if you're misallocating customer assets, um, you know, that there's, you can't do that. And there needs to be some mechanism that people understand that this misallocation and it's, you know, it's fraud and it's customer assets and the government needs to be protecting individuals or, you know, it, it, you run the risk of losing faith in the, you know, entities. Right. And so, you know, I can't say in her case that, you know, 20 years was appropriate, but I think, if she had gotten off on probation, I think people would have looked at it also and said, this is a lot of money that was taken from people. Even if they get most of it back in, we'll say, 18 months or two years, yep. there's a big impact for people who don't have access to their money. And there has to be some recompense for that. Yeah. And look, as a litigator friend of ours told me once, and you just referenced it, David, fraud is fraud, even if everyone gets all of their money back. And you know, justice requires that. I think the other interesting thing about the penalty was... I don't know where the numbers come from. I'm, all, I'm always <laughs> stuck by the numbers from a penalty perspective, David, and, and I'm not a lawyer, so it's always shocking. She also has to forego $11 billion. I, I, I don't think she had $11 billion. That's probably a number that'll never be paid. But also um, any profits based, I guess, on the story or anything. So 
you know, if she writes a screenplay about FTX, she's not getting a dime from it. But I feel like this harkens back to remember the Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. You know, he wrote a book and, you know, that book made multi million dollars and then the movie made a hundred million. Um, but where do those numbers come from? I think they make great headlines. Um, I, that's the bottom line. I, I think I think they come up with an outrageous number so that if somehow, some way, some investment she may have made, you know, in one of these AI companies, maybe, or something, if something does 100x, the government or the creditors will still be receiving right. that. Right. Um, you know, the screenplay part's pretty interesting because I kind of feel like that's kind of new work that they're doing and they're they're telling an interesting story and people want to buy the book. Yep. I mean, you still have to have a way to make a living, but I understand like people have been defrauded. And yep. I think we really have to reiterate that people are not getting their full value back. No, it's, they it's may a good be, point. You know, they may get the fiat back, but they're really not getting their crypto back. Yeah. And that's been a longstanding argument for bankruptcies broadly in crypto. Yeah. Like, why can't I get my crypto back? And I think I, I haven't seen the resolution to the, the news about this, but David, didn't the Securities and Exchange Commission come out and say stablecoin disbursements for bankruptcies is something that they would push back on? Was that the FTX case? I might have missed a few articles. I'm sorry. But again, it's you're not getting what you put in. Yeah, I think the SEC, for their own reasons, are pushing back on distributions and crypto. Now, you know, there is an exemption in bankruptcy so that you could distribute securities to individuals if they wanted to label them securities. Right. Um, look, I think there's a tax impact too. Like if there are people who were savvy and bought Bitcoin early and are now being forced to take it in fiat and had big gains, you know, they could, to the extent that, you know, they're not offsetting losses, you know, have these big tax implications. So you're kind of getting hit twice. A, you're not getting the crypto appreciation and B, you may get a tax impact. And so that doesn't feel very good. And C, you don't have access to your you know, value for a period of time. So I think right. that's like, a, it's not a great situation to be in. And and so, you know, not, I, I think in the future, if we do have a bankruptcy again, my hope is that if people want their, you know, crypto back in crypto and not in fiat, that we get to the place where we can, where th that can happen. Yeah. David, I, I, I mentioned uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which brings us back to our favorite conversations about regulators. Uh, and I'm going to say a phrase that you and I have discussed many, many times. Tell me if I'm wrong. Are regulators picking winners? I think you know where I'm going with mm. this. <clears throat> the SEC put forward that, and again, to be clear, the office of the, the chief accountant at the SEC put forward exemptions to SAB 121, which was basically prohibited financial firms and banks from holding crypto in custody. Uh, and not long after that news, David, the first exemption is... BNY Mellon, the world's largest custodian. Uh, and again, we know the folks at BNY Mellon and, and you know, it, uh, we've always argued that it'd be good to have TradFi mm. in, involved like that, but why wh are they picking winners? It certainly feels that way. Like I'm trying to look at it glass half full that we do need more custodians just for concentration risk. Right. And BNY is certainly more than capable of being a crypto custodian, but I do think that it is not putting the crypto companies on the same level playing field, which they deserve. There should be requirements, but I really think that that SAB 121 should have been pulled. Um, you know, some people have said there's a reason why um, it was vetoed. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to go into the merits of that or not, but I think it should have been pulled. And, you know, I'm not a fan of, of certain organizations getting a benefit over others. I don't think that's what regulation is about. And, uh, you know, I am glad that BNY is going to be a custodian, sure. but I do think that other entities, whether it be Custodia Bank or other entities that are qualified, should be should be allowed to custody as well. What do you think, Ron? I mean, how does that strike you? Like if you were a custodian in the space and, and now you are subject to these regulations and, uh, you know, one of your competitors is getting an exemption and you're not, how, how would that sort of land with you? So, look, I... I to me, it feels unfair, but I also feel like it's it's discounting some like, you know, I've got to imagine BNY Mellon's been doing work in this space and studying this for a long time. They didn't just see the exemption for SAB 121 and put in an application and get approved for the exemption. So to your point, they're the world's largest custodian. They, they do this really, really well. They've got very deep 
compliance and security protocols for a lot of this. And, and, you know, and I agree, though, like if I look at some of the other custodians, they're being disenfranchised unless someone tells me there's a pipeline of exemptions being requested and that the regulator is going to, to look at look through them. I think the other thing that's lost in that dialogue, David, is it's, it needs to be on a case by case basis. Yeah. So when you look at how the regulators approach it, it is not a here's the process for us to help this industry have qualified custodians. It's come in and go through an entire cycle of questions and we may not approve it anyway. So I, I, I get the reason for it. I'm happy for BNY Mellon, um, but it doesn't make things easier for those firms that have really worked hard to try to comply. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that changes with a, a different administration, well, essentially a new administration uh, on either side of the aisle, but um, it'll, be inter- it'll be interesting to see the next Trad5 firm in my mind that gets that exemption and who's applying. Yeah, and look also like, we haven't talked about the, the options for the ETFs too much, which right. I think also is a really big deal. But again, like certainly support BlackRock and uh, yeah, of course. You know, but why only did IBIT get the ETF approval? And what about the other ones? I mean, I don't know that BlackRock's offering is significantly different than Fidelity's, you know, right. ETF. You know, so I don't know why one's getting approved over others. Maybe they asked for it first. I don't know. But it does feel like um, they are, you know, picking certain entities over others to start. You know, and look, let's let's also be clear that a BlackRock reaching out to regulators in D.C. is a very different thing than make up, you know, Ron Q custodian that wants to get involved <laughs> in crypto reaching out to regulators for a variety of different reasons. You know, if we see only TradFi being considered to the exclusion of others that have, you know, to be clear, again, deep compliance benches, these are not fly-by-night operations. These yeah. are these are professionals who understand how the industry works. You know, it tells us that there are there is a bit of picking winners and losers. I I'm I want to make it a political conversation in the sense that I wonder how that stance changes after the election. And, and because when you look at, you know, former President Trump's come out as the, the crypto guy now, when you and I have had doubts about some of that, um, Vice President Harris has come forward recently stating that she's looking for uh, innovation in things like AI and digital assets. Does any of that change, I wonder? Yeah, look, I think I think many of us are trying to keep an open mind. Yep. I think some sort of blanket sweeping statements. Again, keeping an open mind. Uh, Until we get the details, right? Yeah, and also the thing that I think we have to like stare into is, like we can hear the policies of both, you know, former President Trump and Vice President Harris, but in actuality, what are they willing to do to move the ball? Are they willing to have a new SEC commissioner? Uh, you know, and, and there's methods that can be you know pursued. I know, strictly speaking, he has a term. Like, are they willing to invest the capital to say like we want somebody else leading the commission? Um, <clears throat> is somebody willing to come in and, and take a different view of the cases that they're currently being brought against Coinbase, against Kraken, against I don't know if there's still existing case against Binance. So. It's really more than just some nice platitudes about business and wanting us to be, you know, the epicenter of technology. But practically speaking, what steps are they willing to take uh, to move the ball forward? And we know that like politicians can't tell SEC commissioners what to do. Sure. But I think that if you know an SEC commissioner, you know, potential chairperson is going to have a certain view and, and wants to sort of resolve these things and follow Congress's wishes to move the industry forward, you know, there's a path to doing that. David, you know, and it's also, it's not just the presidential part of the election. I mean, certainly the, the House and the Senate. I don't know if you saw it earlier this week. I think it was Wednesday again. Um, the House Financial Services Committee had a full a meeting with the full, all the commissioners of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And you know, some of those conversations were tough on Chair Gensler. I, I don't know the man. I, you know, I, I know whether or not people agree with his positions, but it was fascinating to see across both sides of the aisle um, 
pretty informed conversation. I mean, I grant that to the staffers. But if you looked mm. at Commissioner Peirce, if you looked at Commissioner Ueda, um, even Commissioner Crenshaw, they had very well considered responses to why they agree or disagree with the things that the commission's done. And those, in my mind, those are not conversations that would have happened in the House two years ago. Um, yeah. It was just interesting to see that like battle lines have been, it, or, it's not that battle lines have been drawn so much as some people see a smart way to approach this and others see an obstructionist way to approach this. Boy, that was very diplomatic, Ron. I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> I try, David. I try. I look. I think that. I think I would go so far as to say is, it's okay to have a view, but a regulatory body needs to support, you know, companies in the space, and they need rules of the road, and right. sort of being vague and, and sort of not really telling people what the rules are and saying something's really clear, but then you can't argue that in court and, you know, making up new terms and, and you know, having to apologize in court for making up these new terms. Okay. It's just not consistent with regulation. And I think it was, you know, Commissioner Ueda who said this, that, you know, the sort of stature of the SEC has taken a real hit yeah. uh, in this prior, you know, this four years. And I think it's just, People want to do business here. They want to hire Americans. They want to, you know, do commerce here. And we need a way to do that. And, and it's okay if people don't agree. But I think, you know, we've talked about it before. If we had really spent the effort on drafting regulations instead of, you know, really putting a lot of effort on the enforcement side, I think we could be so much further along. So I think that frustration that I've heard from many people you know, hit the light of days, you know, in particular in this uh, you know, hearing. And David, to that point, I had a conversation this week with a, a colleague who's an attorney in Europe mm. uh, and his business has him throughout Europe, as well as uh, like Dubai and Singapore, like kind of the, the centers of where we're seeing crypto and blockchain adoption. And his perspective was, uh, you know, the United States is falling behind. There's y y there's so much <laughs> happening, even in the context of the MIFID framework or the MICA, the MICA framework that is evolving the industry in Europe because they see it as a competitive advantage. And his response was, I, I don't understand the U.S.'s policy. I think a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think one other thing we really need to think about as we think about these elections is, you know, what party in the Senate and in the House, and obviously elections are dynamic, everybody has tons of issues, but for our industry, what party do we think will benefit, will want to you know, move legislation forward, and what party do we think will you know be supportive of the industry? Right. And I think we need to really think about that because you know the Senate's very important in this process, and so you know maybe people have specific views on who they want to vote for for president, but I think they do need to stare into who they want to vote for. You know, to you know what party they want to run the Senate, yep. you know, as well. And I think that's really important. David, all of that being said, I'm going to wrap us up because we're coming to an end with how we began talking about interest rates. What are you going to wager? I'm not wagering with you anymore, but what are your thoughts uh, about- That's free, Ron. <laughs> I, no, I'm not going to do that. I lose almost every time, um, but I've got to anticipate that corporates and people like Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy are going to be looking at refinances or debt issuances at lower interest rates to buy crypto. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And look, Michael Saylor's been really- a genius in the way he's, you know, borrowing and less than 1% and doing these convertibles and, sure. um, you know, really bullish on the way he's kind of approached this with, you know, it's, it's no risk and no biscuit though. You know, if, if right. you were to see a big, you know, fall and they'd certainly be impacted, but um, look, I really see this fourth quarter barring like a real geopolitical blow up is really going to be up, you know, October and, and really bullish. I think that there's going to be a lot of assets coming in. Uh, I think more people get access to the markets. And I think, as we've talked about before, if we make an all-time high, I really see sort of retail and other folks FOMOing in and not wanting to miss out and seeing a real burst. Yeah. Um, not as bullish as your 125 <laughs> prediction, 
Do I but, still have a chance? <laughs> you know, uh, remember that Jim Carrey movie, you know? <laughs> oh, God. So you're telling me there's a chance. Um, yeah, you're telling me there's a chance. Exactly. But, um, you know, I, look, if we break 73, like I could see us going to 80 fairly quickly. I mean, I think 90 is very doable. Uh, you know, options get approved in some of these other things. And, you know, all this liquidity gets pumped in. Yeah. I think your best chance, Ron, is if China really sort of unleashes the hounds in crypto and allows folks to get involved in crypto. And that might be your best shot. So you're saying I have no shot. <laughs> well, I'm saying there's a chance, you know. <laughs> I wish we could throw memes up. I'd have that Jim Carrey look oh. when he's talking, you know. For everyone in the audience, that means David's going to send me the meme by text message probably before the end of the day. David, uh, we've got to wrap it up. Some news uh, for, for you and I, and obviously the team here has been doing a lot of work. October 24th in New York City, the WSBA Crypto and Blockchain Summit. For anyone who's watching, you can see David Brill on stage and Josh Clayman and Kayvon Sadegi and so many colleagues across different industry verticals. Still time and still seats available. If you're interested in registering, go to the website wsba.co. Any questions, drop us an email, info at wsba.co. David, your Gulfstream lands in the tri-state area when next week? You'll be joining, come up to see Mainnet, right? Yes, I'll be flying up Sunday night to go to Mainnet, which I'm looking forward to. And, uh, you know, I'm glad they scheduled it after the UN left because I was, you know, I wanted actually to go to an event on Wednesday in New York, but I was just like, you know, there was bad weather down here in South Florida and I did not want to be in New York during UN week. That is just asking for trouble. I was in New York City during UN week and it was no picnic. Um, yeah. I will share that with you, David. Uh, and then the last thing I'm going to throw out there for us is uh, no more recommendations about steakhouses for David. Let him decide <laughs> and and we'll take it from there. David, I'll probably see you Monday evening at a separate event. Hopefully I get to spend some time with you and the group next week as well. Stay safe to everyone who's in Florida. Um, please be careful. Obviously, a big storm that landed uh, earlier this morning. But David, thank you so much. Always a privilege for everyone out there. Uh, this will be up on our YouTube channel as well. We will be back with our galloping global co-hosts next weekend. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ron. Take care, everybody. Bye.